Welcome to Town Meeting TV. I'm here with Trish O'Kane. Uh, Trish, why don't you introduce yourself and um, tell us um, a little bit about who you are and where you're working now. You're here at UVM. Yeah, thank you, Megan. Um, it's it's an honor to be with you here today and everyone who's watching. Yeah, my name is Trisha Kane. I teach environmental studies at the University of Vermont. I direct a program called Birding to Change the World, where I take uh, my students every week to a local elementary school in my neighborhood and pair them with kids and we learn outside in the new North End where I live. Um, I also teach a class called Endangered Environmentalists in Central America because I lived in Central America for 10 years, I was a human rights investigative journalist. And so that's kind of the way I connect those two parts of my life. Yeah, and that's where, that's what we're talking about today because we met through some connections around um, Burlington sister city in Nicaragua that you come with um, a history of really supporting the revolution in Nicaragua. Um, a long time ago and are feeling the disillusionment that a lot of folks are feeling. Is that a, is that a correct assessment? Disillusionment, is that a correct, if not? Um, I would say more rage. Um, yeah. Rage and also deep sorrow and um, openness and, and uh, questioning and wanting to learn and think about my own blinders, ideological blinders that I had on. Um, I don't regret supporting the revolution, not for one second. And I tell my students, as soon as I got out of college, I went to support the revolution in Nicaragua. I moved to Managua and I worked for, with the Jesuit order, supporting the Jesuit order and the work they were doing to support the revolution. I were, wrote for a Jesuit magazine. I worked at a Jesuit research institute. And my boss, the, the priest I worked for, Father Javier Gorostiaga, was well known internationally. He was the first minister of planning in the first revolutionary government. So, I mean, he helped make the revolution happen. So, so that's what I went to do. Um, but af after many years of supporting the revolution and watching what's happened in the last, especially the last 15 years, um, you know, it's become a brutal dictatorship. And so it, it's not disillusionment, it, it's horror. Uh, I know people in, in prison and my friends are very afraid, the ones who are not in prison. Um, and I was a journalist there and all the journalists I know have stopped working. The magazine I wrote for, for years, which has been around like four decades, a wonderful Jesuit magazine about economics and policy and politics, uh, a year ago, the editor made the decision to no longer publish. People are too afraid. Yeah. So there's all these journalists in Nicaragua <laughs> who I knew and worked with for years who cannot work. And, and in Nicaragua, that's there's a term for that now. It's called muerte civil. It means a civilian, a citizen death. Yeah. You, you yeah. have to be silent or you risk going to prison. So horror. It's not disillusionment. It's horror. And urgency. What can we do to get people out of prison because they're starting to die? Yep. The first give, us a little, died a month ago. give us a little, you know, snapshot of the last 30 years in Nicaragua. Can you give us like, give us a timeline of um, sure. revolution, Daniel Ortega being. Um, sure. Yeah. Well, I'll make it a little personal. So, you know, the revolution happened in 1979. So many of us admired us. it. I know in Burlington, Burlington was a super important place of support. I was in California starting college. I supported the revolution from there. I was opposing Reagan's war. I was a peace activist. And then in uh, 1987, when I finished college and I'd met this priest at a conference in the U.S. because I was part of the solidarity movement, like so many people in Burlington, and he recruited me to go work for him in Managua because I was bilingual and he wanted me to help because the election was coming up in 1990. The U.S. had this massive kind of propaganda campaign to say that the elections were false and he needed people who could write in English and Spanish to communicate with the U.S. and try to um, counteract that propaganda machine. So, I mean, that's what I was doing there. Um, and then in 1990, um, the Sandinistas lost. Um, I was there during that election. I cried too. It was, um, you know, I wasn't that surprised because as soon as I moved there, I saw things I did not like at all, um, especially as regards Daniel Ortega. I mean, it was obvious by that point he was starting to 
just become too in love with power and, and, you know, power corrupts. Absolutely. That's really true. I, I followed him on his 1990 presidential campaign and I'll never forget it. I'm a feminist and I loved the women's movement in Nicaragua and I, I covered it. I went to many women's meetings and conferences. I was so proud of it and, and awed by it. Um, by what women were, were doing. And when Daniel Ortega had his 1990 election, he chose as his slogan, Daniel es mi gallo, which literally means Daniel is my fighting cock. Okay, that's right. Just throw the women under the bus and appeal to the lowest common denominator. I think that will probably sound familiar to people in the United States, right? Daniel turned into a Donald Trump. That's what I think happened. So I remember following him into villages and he would ride in in his cowboy shirt on a white horse with a cowboy hat and the whole thing. And it was like, oh my God, this is such a macho campaign. What happened to all the women who supported the revolution? And so then he lost the election um, and I was still living in Nicaragua and there was a move, a, a huge movement within the Sandinista party. I was never a member of the party formally, but I was always a supporter. Um, so there was a move within the party to democratize, a very serious movement. And after the, they lost the election, people thought, okay, we're not in the government anymore, but so now we can get to work and democratize the party because there's no war anymore. We're not going to be invaded. We need some democracy. Something happened here. We should, some of the people, Stan and Issa said, we need to listen to the people. They voted. They voted us out. Why did they vote us out? So I went to, I attended the party Congress in 1995 in Managua. I was actually covering it as a journalist for um, Radio Pacifica in San Francisco. And I was still living in Central America at the time. At that time I was in Guatemala and I went to Managua. I covered that, conf that, that party conference and that was when the party split. And I mean, I stood there with my microphone recording and cried. And I said, this is the funeral of the Sandinista party. People didn't like it on the left in the US when they heard this story, but I literally watched Daniel Ortega stopping Sergio Ramirez, Doria, Dora Maria Tellez, Sergio is, was the vice president. He's now in exile in Spain. He can't return to his country. Dora Maria Tellez is in prison, rotting. Um, I watched these people stand up and try to say, we need to democratize the party. And Daniel Ortega stopped it all and they walked out. And I stood there crying with my microphone. And, and that, that was it. I said, that's it. This is it, this is the end, what's gonna happen now? So that was 1995. What happened after that, there were a series of governments you know, moderate kind of right wing business aligned governments in Nicaragua. And then Ortega was reelected in, I think it was 2006. So he has been in power since 2006. And the first, one of the first things he did, this is, this really indicates where he was headed and how wrong we were. One of the first things he did was he, he went back on one of the pledges of the Sandinista revolution, which was the Sandinistas came in and changed the constitution so that the president could only have one term. So you would never have a Somoza dictatorship again. I mean, we supported the Somoza dictatorship. People here in Burlington know that was three Somozas in a row, the father and two sons. And the yeah. revolution was about that never happening again. And so the first thing Ortega, one of the first things Ortega did was to get that constitution changed and get an amendment so he can run indefinitely. So that was a sign right there. Oh my God, we are in trouble, right? But I was back in the US, you know, doing other things like a lot of people. I still, I had my friends there. I communicated with them. He got back in power. It was very gradual since 2006, Megan, that he started to make these changes. And one of the, one of the theories and the analysis, analyses I've read say this, that Ortega was so traumatized by the 1990 loss, he was like, that's never gonna happen to me again. Because the US did, the US threw all that money and all that political machinery behind Violeta Chamorro and, and the opposition that the US actually molded. And so Ortega said, I lost because the Catholic church wouldn't support me. The business people wouldn't support me. The U.S. wouldn't support me. That's never going to happen again. So he gets in power. The first thing he, one of the first things he does is make sure he can run over and over and over again. He makes his peace with the Catholic church. He's supposed to be an atheist. Him and his wife go to the bishop and say, we want to get married and we're Catholic. Okay. Everything's all good now with the Catholic church, even though it was really right wing, the, the, the bishops, right? And then he makes his peace with the U.S., 
And so I think a lot of people don't know here, even though there's sanctions against Nicaragua, economic sanctions, our military does exercises in Nicaragua. So, you know, we are supporting a dictatorship in Nicaragua. And the reason we are supporting a dictatorship is because Ortega has a deal with the U.S. to stop people from coming across Nicaragua that are trying to get to the United States. And not just from Latin America, from Africa and China. Some of these people have disappeared. And who was the, who was the, who was the president that made that agreement with Nicaragua? Do you know when, when, that, was, when that policy was well, put in place? I'm not saying there was there's an agreement or a written agreement. Yeah. There's a quid pro quo, right? Yeah. Okay, and it's part of Ortega's um, strategy to maintain himself in power. He's not going to go up against the U.S. again. He's no fool. He figured it out. What he wants is to stay in power. So who do I have to keep happy? And as far as the church is concerned, he threw the whole women's movement under the bus, wiped out any uh, uh, rights to abortion in Nicaragua, which was very important during the revolution. And now Nicaragua, I think it has the worst and the most restrictive abortion laws in all of Latin America. I don't even think if the mother's health is endangered, you can get an abortion. Don't quote me on that, but it's one of the worst, if not the worst. So, I mean, it was just, it started with the church and then the U.S. And it's just one by one, he started taking, he started eliminating the gains of the revolution and consolidating his power. So that's been happening from 2006 up until 2018, when uh, we started with college students at the University of Central America, the Jesuit University. And in my class that I teach here at UVM, I connected the students at that university in Managua with my students via Zoom before COVID. Yeah. And the students, the students there explained to my students here, environmental students, what happened. This is what the Nicaraguan students said. They said, there was a massive wildfire burning out of control in a, um, a very important uh, Mayan reserve, a bio reserve in Nicaragua. The students said the government wasn't doing anything to put out the fire, that the environmental ministry was corrupt. It didn't have very much money. And the students were very upset about this. So they got, they made their signs and they went and stood out in the street in front of the Jesuit university and started protesting. That's how the 20, April 2018 insurrection started. Got it wasn't it. a coup, you know, there's, you know, it was, it was started with college students. And then what happened is once the students started protesting, other sectors of the population took note. And Ortega at that time, I don't know exactly why, but decided maybe it was budget cuts to social security. So he hit the pensioners the same month that April, that the students were in the street, like a week or two later, he hit the pensioners. And so the college students, they told this to my students, they said, it was our grandparents. Like we live with our grandparents. Everybody lives in the same house here. They were cutting their pensions. And so then old people, young people, everybody got out in the street and that's when the police opened fire and they, they occupied the university. My students were so stunned when they heard these stories from Nicaraguan students. Uh, and they opened fire and they killed like 22 students. Yeah. And it, and and Ortega has now just um, done another lockdown on the public universities recently, yeah. right? Yeah, he's confiscating uh, private universities mm -hmm. and um, anybody who criticizes his regime loses their job. I know doctors who've lost their job. After, after whenever there was protests, doctors in the public hospitals were told, if you help a wounded protester, you're fired. I know someone that happened to. I mean, so you're just talking a draconian um, shutdown across the government. Uh, the, the OAS ambassador, who I know we're going to get to, to Nicaragua, Arturo McFields Yescas, who just resigned publicly in the middle of an OAS meeting denouncing his government as a dictatorship. I've been listening to a lot of interviews with him afterwards, and so he knows what's going on on the inside of the government. And he's just described how people are so afraid at all levels of the government. Um, you know, and they're told you can't do this, you can't do that. And people have just really shut down. So it's a police state. I mean, the police on the street will take your phone away. My, my friend who I work with there, a journalist who's been one of my best friends for 30 years, the first interviews I ever did as a journalist, the first interview I ever did as a journalist, Megan, was with Dora Maria Tejas when she was health minister. Mm. 
in the 80s in Nicaragua. So, I mean, in, you know, now she's rotting in prison. But my friend and I who've worked together for many years and who's helped me teach this class in Vermont, she's gone from speaking openly on Zoom to my students to now we only communicate about once a month and are extremely careful. She doesn't go out much. She can't work. Um, it's, it's just terrifying. Yeah. And what is, I mean, here's a maybe overly simplistic question, but I feel like back in the eighties that, the, you know, the bad guy was the U S government yeah, getting involved in this uprising. And now it, it feels more complicated than that. It's like a network of, um, pro-democracy with a small D not the pro-democracy of, um, you know, the hammer of the United States. We're going to go in and we're going to make democracy happen. Yeah. But small d, those of us who really believe in people, um, people's political power. This, can you talk to me a little bit about that as you've kind of grown through your own yeah. political awareness and who, who are the, who, who, you know, here's, um, McField's part of the OAS and, you know, really good people inside the U.S. government that are condemning what's going on inside Nicaragua. Yeah. How is that for you with your background, seeing um, these allegiances that are confusing and complicated? Well, it's very important. It's especially important to my teaching because, you know, I went there in the 80s and you remember what the 80s was like. It was a war. I mean, the largest, the most powerful country in the world was attacking one of the smallest country in the world because they were trying to teach people to read and help people farm. And it isn't all that simplistic. The Sandinistas did some terrible, stupid things during the 80s too, right? That I can see more clearly now, but they did a lot of great things. That's why we supported that revolution. So, you know, the US was the villain, it was Reagan, but I've learned since then, you know, even the villain says things that are true. It's not all lies. Um, so yes, it's much more complex. And the 1990 election is really interesting because I was covering that so closely and traveling, you know, following Ortega around, following all of the candidates around. And I actually wrote a guide for the United Nations that was monitoring the elections on all the camps. So I interviewed every single political party. Some of them were receiving money from the U.S. At that time, I thought that was horrible. Um, and I thought the U.S. shouldn't be intervening in other people's elections. But, you know, <laughs> Now in Nicaragua, some of the people being charged and put in prison, and it's because they've received money from some U.S. organization. I mean, the fact is in Nicaragua, nobody can do anything without money from abroad. I mean, all of the NGOs are funded by the European Union or the Norwegian aid you know, ministry or the Danish foreign aid. I mean, all the NGOs operate with foreign funds. But what, what the government's doing is saying, if you take anything from the US, you're toast. Mm -hmm. So so it's more complicated. Uh, I like what you said about the little d. And I think that even if it's complicated and messy, and I'm sure the US is still trying to you know mess around. I don't have any <laughs> doubt about that. And I do not support any kind of military intervention in Nicaragua. No matter what happens, Nicaraguans have to overthrow their own dictator again, and, and they're trying very, very hard. But well, we shouldn't be supporting a dictator, uh -huh. right? Yeah. So it's, now, so it's more complex, definitely yeah. more complex. Tell us, uh, um, Hugo um, Torres. Torres Jimenez, right? So he just died in prison in yep. February. Tell us a little bit about him. And he had some, you know, he, I think he, you know, in, the, in what I was reading, he lived a pretty low key life moderate. Yep. Um, just tell us a little bit about him. Yeah, well, that was very sad. I, I didn't know him personally. I mean, I saw him at press conferences. I, I don't think I, I didn't ever interview him, but he was a very good person. Um, respected. You know, people in Nicaragua were saying he was a national hero because he wasn't one of those people that became rich from the revolution. Because that's something that happened that also was very disturbing. And I saw it. In 1990, when the Sandinistas lost, didn't happen with my friends who were Sandinistas, all of them left the party. But the ones who stayed in, it was called La Piñata, the Piñata. I mean, people literally just, okay, we're gonna lose the government in six months, it's gonna be a new government, we're gonna have to leave. So I'm gonna take this desk and computer home. You know, they, they just, the car, they took stuff from the state, right? Mm -hmm. Hugo yeah. Torres didn't do that. So he, he, he was considered to be more ethical. 
But um, so he was one of the people arrested. Hugo Torres, he was one of the people who freed Daniel Ortega. Daniel Ortega, when he was a guerrilla fighter in the 1970s, was imprisoned by the Somoza regime and tortured. Hugo Torres mounted was part of a, a, an operation that liberated him. Now Ortega arrested Torres because he's an opposition leader and he, he's so well regarded, threw him in prison. Torres, I don't know if he was 70, around 70 years old or 70 something, had cancer and he died. You know, I think it was early February. The, the, the regime um, wouldn't release any details. Nobody knew what happened. They even lied about the day that he died. Nobody knew where he was. He was now, we know from press reports in the hospital and his children did get to say goodbye to him. But um, the family, the, the government, the regime refused to do an autopsy. Human rights organizations were asking for an autopsy and the regime handed the family a bag of ashes. They didn't mm -hmm. get to see his body. So this is being described as just cruelty, deliberate cruelty yeah. on the part towards someone who liberated Ortega from prison. Yeah. And to, that's a, that's a, to put it lightly, that's bad karma. It's it's it's, it's, it's that's why I say yeah. I, I'm not disillusioned. I'm horrified. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, let's talk a, um, about the BOAS. So that's the Organization of American States. Yeah, what, is, yeah. what is that? Tell us a little bit. What is the Organization well, of American States? It's kind of like a United Nations of Latin America. Um, and like the United Nations, the U.S. has always had a very powerful role. So it's always been seen kind of by the left, by myself included, as, as a, an organization too manipulated by the U.S., Right. So if the OAS said something in, in the 80s and even 90s, I really was like, oh, it's the OAS, you know, the U.S. is pulling the strings there. Um, and that's probably still true to a great extent. But I do think there are other countries in Latin America that are that have a, a greater voice than they did before. And like something very hopeful. People don't know it. The new president of Chile, Gabriel Boric, if you want to cry with joy watch his inauguration speech. He was a student leader just not even a, several years ago. And now he's present. He's not, he's like 30, 31 or so. He's very young and um, very dynamic. And he, a person on the left who has said in his speech that Chile is going to support human rights and going to denounce human rights violations wherever they are. They don't care if it's a government of the left or the right. So this is a different kind of leftist government. Um, so I think the OAS, I hope, I hope people like Gabriel Boric will have more of a voice in the OAS. But what happened with the OAS was um, recently because of the human rights violations, because Nicaragua had an election in November that was um, most people did not participate in. There was massive abstentionism. Media um, estimates maybe 70 percent abstentionism, which is very sad because when I lived there in 1990, it was like, I don't know, 80 or 90 percent. It was crazy. I mean, people were lined up for hours to vote. And, you know, this was massive abstentionism. Right. Um, so the OAS. Um, well, what happened right before the election, months before Ortega started locking up all the candidates for the opposition, charging them with bogus stuff. Um, so there would be no one to run against him who could possibly win. Um, and so the OAS has been making pronouncements and pronouncements about this. So it's been a very contentious relationship between the OAS and Nicaragua and also the UN. I mean, he threw, Ortega threw out the UN. The UN has tried to get delegations in there human rights delegations. And he, 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 he's thrown out the UN. So the UN can't get in there. The OS, OAS, I don't think could get in there. And um, it's been a very contentious, like the 80s, except, except we really, Nicaragua really needs international human rights organizations pressuring and observing what's going on. I mean, any point of pressure, again, I don't support any kind of military intervention whatsoever or the CIA messing around no. in Nicaragua because of the history. So, yeah, so Arturo McFields is the OAS ambassador from Nicaragua. Yeah. He's yeah. been in there for, how? he was there for a couple of years at least, right? No, no, Arturo no. McField is, he's a very interesting he's person. New. Okay, all right. He's new. So in 2011, <laughs> he was named to be the press, Nicaraguan press attache in Washington at the embassy. So you're talking one of the Nicaragua's international mouthpieces in Washington. 
Very important and prestigious post, right? Before he'd been a journalist in Nicaragua, a TV journalist, the only TV journalist allowed to film inside the Ortega's personal residence. That's how close he is to Daniel Ortega and Rosario Murillo. His father, David McFields, was a famous poet. And Rosario Murillo, vice president, Rosario Murillo, that's the other thing Ortega did. He became president. He made his wife vice president. Okay, so we're talking a family dictatorship, Somoza style, all over again. Nightmare, right? So she's a famous poet, and she had a group of very, you know, close poets around her. McField's father was one of those. So this guy in the OAS who just resigned publicly, very, very close to the Ortegas. So in November, Daniel Ortega, the president of Nicaragua, named McField's to be ambassador to the OAS. And I just listened to some long interviews with him explaining because Nicaraguan journalists in exile are asking him, why did you accept this post if you really felt this way? And he said, I did it on purpose because I really believed I could change the system from within. And because the only way for me to speak to the president and his wife and get to power was to have a very high post. He said, that's why I did it. And I tried, I begged. He said, my goal was just to even get 10 political prisoners out of jail by December, the ones that are gonna die, including he really was busted up when he, up Hugo Torres. He said, I warned them in October or take Hugo Torres, you've got to let him out. Uh And then he died, you know, and he said, I'm not going to say I told you so, but he told them so. So he purposefully took that post. I don't think with the intention of resigning, he really believed that there needed to be people on the inside. That's what he's saying in the interviews. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. Um, Shall we listen to his? So there's a, there's a speech that's circulating on Twitter and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so that we can listen to that and you can give us a translation of it. I speak today in the name of more than 177 political prisoners and more than 350 Nicaraguans who have lost their lives in my country since 2018. I speak today in the name of thousands of Nicaraguan civil servants civilian and military, those today in Nicaragua who are forced to pretend by the regime and to fill the public squares shouting party slogans, because if they don't do it, they'll lose their jobs. To denounce a dictatorship in my country is not easy, but to continue to be silent and defend the indefensible is impossible. I must speak, Mr. President, even though I'm afraid. I must speak even though my future and my family's future is uncertain. I must speak because if I don't do it, the very stones of the earth are going to speak for me. Days before Nicaragua announced its withdrawal from the OAS, we met in the foreign ministry with a team of presidential advisors In this meeting, I suggested that we release at least 20 elderly political prisoners and another 20 prisoners whose health conditions demand our consideration. I told them this would be a humanitarian gesture and politically intelligent because no one should die in prison, especially if they are innocent or because of inadequate medical attention or because they received no medical care whatsoever. No one would listen to me, Mr. President. They said, we're not even going to write that down, what you just said, because you know what could happen. And remember, they said, the more bones we throw to the right wing, the more they'll demand from us. This is what they told me in that meeting. In this government, nobody, nobody listens. And nobody speaks. I've tried several times over the last several months, but every door shut on me. I've always believed that dialogue and diplomacy weren't that important in times of peace and tranquility and democracy, but that diplomacy is needed most during the difficult times, the complex times, the times of democratic crisis like the one my country is living through right now. 
However, what I've learned over these past months is that the situation in Nicaragua is too much for my meager diplomatic skills. Ambassador Mendez, can I proceed? Senor Presidente, Mr. Chairman, there is a point of order, uh, and then the ambassador is asking to proceed. You can do the point of order and then return to the ambassador, if that is what you wish to do, sir. I, I, will, I will ask you to finish, to let me finish, because I'm about to finish shortly. Okay, would you be kind enough to finish Nicaragua, please? Yes, I will, I will. It's just one minute and a half. Since 2018, Nicaragua has become the only country in Central America, probably in all of Latin America, where there are no longer any printed newspapers, where you don't have the freedom to even post a critical tweet or comment in social media. There are no longer any human rights organizations. There are none. Well, just one. The rest were shut down or expelled from the country. There are no independent political parties. There are no real elections. There is no separation of powers just dark powers, powers operating outside the institutional and democratic realm. This year, the government has begun to confiscate private universities. It shut down 137 nonprofit organizations, Catholic organizations, evangelical organizations, environmental organizations, Operation Smile, Mr. President. And the list continues to grow. 170,000 Nicaraguans have fled the country. Others are trying to flee right now while I'm speaking. Mr. President, to finish, I'd like to say that all, although it appears that all is lost and the panorama is very dark, I believe firmly that there is hope. I've said this to many people. Everyone inside the government and outside, everyone is tired of this dictatorship and its actions. Every day, there will be more people tired of this dictatorship and who say, basta, enough. Because the light will always overcome the shadows, because love is stronger than hate, and because you can lie to the people some of the time, but not all the time. God may take his time, but he never forgets you. Thank you. Is it that that's a pretty powerful statement? Um, what tell us a little bit? What was the interruption? Was that interruption a political interruption? Was somebody trying to get him to stop speaking, or was it just like a no? No. So imagine <clears throat> a meeting of the OAS, and it was some procedural meeting. Yeah. And he raised his hand and asked to speak, and he he gave this statement. So they weren't expecting it. That I I don't remember. It's a subcommittee or something of the OAS, and they were doing something, and so I, people were just stunned. Yeah, I mean this is, this has never happened before. In the middle and where of where is OAS, he? Where is he now? And his family? He, he lives in. He's lived in Washington since 2011. Yeah. yeah. But but um, I've I've listened now to two long interviews with him, um, with Nicaraguan media that's in exile, and um, he has a lot of family in Nicaragua, and he's afraid for them, yeah. brothers and sisters, and you know, um, so he's been in Washington, but he goes back and forth to Nicaragua, and he's been questioned pretty, you know, severely by these Nicaraguan journalists, like, why did you wait so long? And he said, you don't understand. Like they said, why did you say that? The, because he, before the OAS, he protested that the OAS criticized the election. That was his role. And he said, no, this was a, you know, a fair election and everybody could vote and blah, blah, blah. And, and the journalist said this morning said, you know, why did you say that? And he said, you don't understand. I was in Nicaragua, they could take my passport away. He said, there, there are ministers in the government that, that have had their passports taken because people yeah. are defecting. This is a major public defection. But he said, there are many, many people who've been leaving the government for quite some time. He said, they just do it quietly because they have mansions and properties they've accumulated. And he said, but I'm broke. Estoy palmado, he said, I don't have anything. I'm in DC, you know, with his family. Yeah, and so I guess he figured he had nothing to lose. Yeah, so but his one of the things, great. yeah, one of the things that we talked about because I think we'll we'll come to a close, and I think you know you've said it a few times. No, 
U.S. intervention in yeah. Nicaragua. Um, also, the lack of news in U.S. newspapers. I think the yeah. Washington Post had something that you shared about his defection, but nothing in the New York Times. Tell us where you go to get news and information. And there is, um, for Spanish speakers, Arturo McField is going to have a, a Q&A session in Spanish on the 30th of March. Um, so yeah. I'll put that information here as well. But tell us where you go to get information and what, you know, anybody watching this might take away. Yes. Well, that's that's a very important question and something I talk about with my students. Like, If you don't read in Spanish, um, you know, and I tell my students, you've got to study other languages. What happened during the 80s, as you probably know, and other people listening know, there was an amazing network of solidarity um, journalism. And a lot of that has just collapsed. Most of it has collapsed. Like the magazine that I work for in Nicaragua, people are too afraid to write. So all those journalists are out of work or, you know, they're just sitting at home. So that's why we're not hearing. And the, the solidarity journalism that still exists in the U.S., I'm very sorry, sorry to say most of it supports the Ortega regime. Now, I don't blame them. I can understand because in the 80s, I didn't believe a lot of this stuff either. And so I think people think that it, that the U.S. is lying, but Nicaraguans aren't lying. But if you don't speak Spanish, how do you get those voices? Um, so here's what I do. First of all, I have my friends there that give me information. Um, but I read every day. I look up confidencial. Now that's in Spanish, C-O-N-F-I-D-E-N-C-I-A-L. That is an, the only independent media left, Nicaraguan media. And the editor had to go into exile because both his brother and sister have been just arrested. That's Carlos Fernando Chamorro, who was a Sandinista. Right. He, he was the editor of Barricada when I lived there. Barricada was the Sandinista newspaper. Okay? So he was a Sandinista journalist, and now he's the only independent journalist left. Um, but he had to leave the country because they were going to arrest him. Um, so I go there. But if you go to the Havana Times, that's an independent Cuban media, critical on the left, that publishes um, some stuff in English. It has a section in English on Nicaragua. And I know the editor, his name is Circles Robinson. He lived in Nicaragua 30 years, he had to leave. Um, his wife is still there. And, and I think a couple of his children, Circles went there as, in solidarity to Matagalpa in the um, 80s and, and you know participated in all kinds of projects and he's still trying to help Nicaragua. So Havana Times is a good one. I mean, I look at the Guardian, they have more stories. Yeah. I look at El País of Spain, um, but there is a total lack. I mean, especially since the war in Ukraine started and not that that's not important. It's very, very important and it's heartbreaking and horrific. Yeah. Uh, by the way, Ortega was one of the first leaders of the world to um, say that he supported Putin. Yeah. And he thought that that was a good idea. In fact, I, I have a quote from Daniel Ortega, which just give people an idea of where, what direction he's taken. He said, after uh, Putin invaded Ukraine, he said, quote, I'm sure that if they, meaning Ukraine, do a referendum like the one carried out in Crimea, people will vote to annex their territories to Russia. And really, that was February 21st, 22, 2022, reported in Reuters. Yeah, I mean, a month later, really? You think the Ukrainians yeah. are all gonna vote to annex their territory to Russia? So that's, that's where he's coming from. Um, so I get my information all over the place, but mo a lot of it, the best is in Spanish and it really comes from Confidencial and the Havana Times. I am very deeply frustrated by the lack of information. Give you another example of the skewed media coverage. I mean, how, how little there is and how ridiculous it is. I mean, we're seeing these heartbreaking images of children in the Ukraine and their cars with their stuffed animals having to flee and go across the border and it's horrible. But the yeah. same day in the New York Times, there was a front page story of a little girl in the car looking out the window with tears in her eyes. That same day, there was a story in the Mexican newspapers about a 19 year old pregnant Nicaraguan girl about to give birth. She was in the back of a truck, a closed cargo truck filled with people trying to get across the border to the US. The smugglers yeah. abandoned the truck in the heat. Did you see this story? Uh -uh. They abandoned the truck in the heat. Those people were locked in there without air. They finally managed to get the door open. And as they opened it, they trampled her. She died. Where's that story? Yeah. Yeah. These are refugees. Yeah. Well, there's, yeah. I mean, 
there's a lot of threads here. The importance of a free press, the importance of, you know, that uh, a, a democratic society is only as strong as the ability to protect the voices of dissent. Um, racism, right, our, you know, our, our willingness to see the suffering of people that look like the dominant majority versus the folks that don't. So, yeah, there are a lot of threads here. But Megan, I'd like and to say we're one, in dark times. Yeah. But I'd like to say one more thing. There is something we can do. I mean, I know we have economic sanctions, and I know some people don't agree with economic sanctions. My friends in Nicaragua want more sanctions. I don't think our military should be doing exercises there. Uh, and I also think that Burlington has a very special responsibility. Just like I feel I have a special responsibility as a person of the left who who, who supported the revolution, who moved to Nicaragua, who became a Nicaraguan resident and lived there. I have to examine my own blinders and we need moral sanctions. And, and this is an appeal to Senator Sanders and his supporters and I support him, <laughs> I love him. Um, where's the moral sanction on Ortega? Senator so Sanders, talk, yes. thank, yeah. thank you for denouncing Vladimir mm -hmm. Putin and your statements and your videos. And I've sent them to my students and people. Where's the statement denouncing the dictator in Nicaragua that you and I both supported? That would be a very powerful moral sanction to the left internationally, and especially people who still support Ortega and don't know all this or don't believe it or think yeah. somebody like me works for the CIA. Yeah. <laughs> so Burlington, Burlington has a history of supporting this revolution, which was about people's empowerment, literacy, yes. women's rights. It was about things that were very much in line with progressive values. That has, yes. that has that has imploded upon itself. And I'm hearing you say that there is a moral imperative for folks in Burlington who supported that to denounce what's going on. Yes. And has, have, has there been any attempt to reach out to Sanders in particular about that? Yes, yes, there yeah. has. I tried, I've been trying since 2018. And um, the editor of Confidencial, Carlos Fernando Chamorro, who does a wonderful weekly TV, wants to interview you, Senator Sanders, um, and both his brother and sister are now in prison. They've been uh, charged or convicted eight years on trumped up charges, and he is in exile, but he, he would really like to interview Senator Sanders, and it would be a message to the left internationally, and I think it echoes what the, president, the new president of Chile is saying, and again, I, I want to end up with a hopeful uh, message, Gabriel Boric, you know, we have to denounce human rights violations wherever they are, here in Guantanamo, in our own prisons, the death penalty, and in Nicaragua and in Russia, wherever they are, and especially yeah. where we have a, a long and terrible history of being involved. Yeah, I've never understood why that was confusing to folks, but it is because of political power. So Trish, thank you so much um, for sharing your the breadth and depth of your knowledge with everyone today. Thank you so much, Megan. It's been wonderful to be with you here today discussing such an important topic to people in Burlington and Nicaragua.